regardless of what we are carrying, when we are partnering and linking arms with other people, it gives us energy, it gives us motivation, it can refill our cup when we are exhausted and confused and frustrated and looking around trying to figure out what our potential next steps can be. So my goal for this whole series is to create community and to establish connections and to start a conversation. And part of that conversation happens through some of the seeds that I might be planting with you today. Part of the conversation also happens in the chat function. So if something that I say really hits home for you, drop in, drop in a question, um, drop in some thoughts about it. If you have questions, drop those in the chat. I'm able to see that and I can respond to those as we go along. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to be sharing the wisdom that's in this room because each one of us is bringing our own experiences with every single one of these topics to the table. And it's an opportunity for us to really learn, for one, learn from one another as we go forward. So today is, is one of my all-time favorite topics and it's really around boundaries. And it's around not only why they're important, but why they're essential. We're gonna be diving into some conversations today and my invitation to all of you is to do that with a sense of curiosity and an openness and a willingness to reflect. This is, this is a space of non-judging. This is a space of openness and wonder and curiosity for us to start to have a dialogue and for us to take away ideally what we need in this moment. There are no right or wrong answers and this is not a prescriptive session where you must learn and master these three things in order to complete it. This is about us starting to think about where we are um, and maybe some adjustments that we can make going forward. So I'm gonna ask Tasha to advance the slide. And when we talk about boundaries, my first question for you is what words or images come to mind when you hear the word boundaries? And as I started looking around over the weekend, um, I found all these different images which might absolutely describe your image in your mind that comes when someone says, let's have a conversation about boundaries. Are they fluid? Are they absolutely set and rigid? Um, can they be like a clay tennis court where oh, there can be a little bit of dust on it and we're not really sure? So our starting place is what comes to mind, what words, what images, maybe even an experience that comes to mind when someone says boundaries to you. So if you wanna put some of those into the chat, that would be fantastic. And it's also an opportunity to start thinking about where are the different boundaries in our lives, right? Where do we have them? Where do we hold them? With a person, with a situation, with a relationship, all those different things. And as we go forward today, our conversation is really gonna focus on the importance of having them. And what I will say to you at the very start is, boundaries are not intended to be a way to, they don't, they don't have to be a way to keep people out. They don't have to be something that is so rigid and so given um, and so structured that they are punitive in nature. Um, Lucy says boundaries are about personal space. Absolutely, yes, totally agree. Um, I'm gonna ask Tasha to advance the slide for, for us now because we're gonna begin by a little bit of assessment. And what I will say to you is that boundaries are essential for one incredible reason, and honestly, in my mind, for really one reason only. They serve as an indicator of how we respect and honor ourselves. And I wanna let that sink in for just a moment, because it might be a way that you may have never thought about boundaries before. But the boundaries that we hold with people, with institutions, with situations, across our lives are really this indication of our, of our self-respect. 
they're also a way that we empower other people. Because we call other people to a higher place when we have boundaries in place, when we know where they are, when we know when someone is kind of poking on them a little bit, when we know physically and emotionally when they are crossed. And again, for some of you, the idea of boundaries as, a, as, an, as an empowerment tool, you might be sitting there thinking, she has clearly lost her mind. How can that be true? <laughs> but they're an empowerment tool because they allow us to not allow other people in our lives to play small or make excuses or not take responsibility for themselves. So a lot of our messaging about what our boundaries are comes from a very, very early age. These are, yes, Barbara, exactly. We are taught, we are modeled boundaries when we are knee high to a stump, when we are very, very small, when we start to look around in our environment, even though as really young children, we can't necessarily put the language to it, we know what we see. And those are incredibly powerful imprints on us as young people. So here's a question. What kind of early messaging did you get as a child? What did you see at home? What kind of boundaries might you have seen in school, in your neighborhood, in your community, or even early on in your career? What messages did you get about boundaries? Um, yep, we've got some folks saying that there have been some failed attempts at setting them. That means that you are human, <laughs> and that is true for all of us. Yes, language as a good girl, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Cynthia has, yep, raised with boundaries and someone who, who served in the military. That is a beautiful way to, to both learn them and have them set for you and to really know the parameters within which we can function. Absolutely. Some of the early messages could be, um, could be around whether or not you were seen, whether or not you were heard, whether or not your creativity was stifled or nurtured. Were you encouraged to express your opinion? Were you able to articulate your needs and have them met? Were you taught to care for yourself? Were there messages in place about caring for who you are? Um, maybe you were taught to serve others before honoring yourself. That was a big message in my family. A lot of it was about putting ourselves um, very last on our priority list and seeing, um, I saw interesting and kind of conflicting messages from my parents. One of them um, was very much of the mindset of everyone else comes before me. So that left a powerful imprint on me when I went into adolescence, when I went into college and grad school and into my professional life. Um, that's a powerful story that I imprinted that I told myself if I wanted to be good at my job if I wanted to be helpful if I wanted to be worthy everyone else had to come before I did because that's what I saw that's what I saw as as a good parent um, Barbara yes children are seen but not heard mm-hmm absolutely right what are some of those early messages around using our voice around play around interactions so here's another question for you um, that really absolutely hits home to boundaries. Were you surrounded by examples of adults saying yes and saying no, maybe with or without conflict? Um, did you grow up in a family where the answer to everything was yes, even if you didn't have time or didn't feel like you had the capacity to, um, capacity to meet that need? Mm-hmm. Yep. And Nicole says, everyone came before her and I've picked up in that place. Absolutely. Yes. We are programmed about so many things in our lives and so many things in our relationships. So here's my first question. And there's going to be three. And th these are really going to tap us and invite us to get really honest with ourselves. The first one is this. 
are your boundaries crossed frequently either with or without your consent? And if they are, you can type, put in a yes or put in a no in the chat. If, you're, if different boundaries that you have are crossed frequently. Um, or maybe somebody doesn't totally cross it, but it's sort of like they stand right on it, right? They sort of stand on it and kind of look at you like, hmm, is the ball in or out? And, and there, there's just this testing that shows up. Absolutely. Seeing a lot of yeses. So here's the moment for us to get really honest with ourselves. If we find ourselves in a position where our, bond, where our boundaries are crossed frequently, with or without consent, it's really about us and not about the other person. Because we are giving people permission to cross them. We're giving people permission to somehow cross boundaries, somehow have us come in and bail them out, somehow even be manipulated in different situations, whether or not it's in our personal or our professional lives. When we, and see if this is true for you, it might be, um, do you find yourself in your organization as someone who consistently kind of picks up the mess left behind by others? Are you that go-to person in your organization where if something isn't done, they know to give it to, they know to bring it right to my office because they know that regardless of what I have going on, I'm going to drop what I'm doing or I'm going to figure out how to rearrange my time and get it done for someone else. If that's our pattern, it's about noticing the why behind it. It's about understanding and starting to tune into when every time that I step in when someone else drops the ball, I'm sending a message to that person that I don't really think they're up to the task. That something in me says, mm, I might be able to do it better. The empowerment part of this is we're taking away an opportunity for another person to grow. If one of our colleagues is not fabulous at time management and every time there's a deadline that comes up and they find themselves in a position where it's not done and they say, Nicole, I need you to help me, I was really busy, and we step in, we're taking away their opportunity to build that skill, to learn how to manage time, to develop a skill, to share their thoughts and their expertise. We're, and the more consistently we do it, we're also sending a powerful message that somehow we don't really think that they can. And is that the message that we want to be sending to colleagues, to people in our personal lives, to people in our faith communities? Likely not. So this is the place where boundaries become an opportunity to empower others to become their best self instead of us who have that tendency to go in and save, to go in and help, to go in and rescue. Um, that's us enabling existing behavior. And we need to think about what that's really about for us. Can it be going back to some of those early messages when we were younger? Um, can it be about watching people around us, saving others, and that being the good parent, the good sibling, the good daughter, the good spouse? Sometimes when we step in and pick up the pieces and pick up the ball that has been dropped, it can really be about our own need to feel needed or seen or heard. This can get us into that really tricky place of martyrdom, right? We sacrifice ourselves in order to help somebody else, in order to serve our organization. It's not about our organizations. It's about our yes and our no and our relationship with ourself. So, radical honesty moment number two. I told you, we're diving in today. <laughs> this next one is 
when you think about if you're someone whose boundaries are tested or crossed frequently, might there be a part of you that believes that sacrificing yourself will reduce the fear or the risk of failure, right? Sometimes when we are feeling a little bit uncertain about our abilities, questioning our role, questioning our competency, questioning our kind of place within our organization or within our team, we may be much more inclined to say yes to things and to help others out to help regularly instead of helping to empower someone else to take responsibility. Here's a piece that I love. Um, and Ariana Huffington speaks very eloquently about sleep and burnout and losing ourselves in our work. And this was very much true for me. Um, it took me a long time to have some pretty healthy boundaries with work and with hours and time spent. And some of that was, it was very easy for me to go into this place of, I am going to live to work. So I was putting in crazy amounts of hours all the time. That was really about my own insecurity and had nothing to do with my organization. So here's one of the things that, that Ariana says in her book on becoming fearless. And she speaks very eloquently about the role of fear in creating compulsions um, to become a workaholic. And this may hit home for some of you as well. If some of that challenge is really about having boundaries with the time, the amount of time that we are spending at work, this may hit home. And she says this, fear creates insecurity and insecurity creates another costly byproduct, workaholism. When we are afraid of failing, when we feel we constantly have to prove ourselves, we give priority to our jobs over everything and everyone else. This depletes our health and our spirits and keeps us in a state of constant tension. When workaholism sets in, we sacrifice the important on the altar of the urgent. Our lives lose their balance and we lose our center. The problem often stems from a massive and wrong-headed redefinition of the urgent. It's no longer a matter of worrying about how we deal with a blazing fire. Instead, it's the constant fear that a fire might start. So if you have ever been in this place where your priority was your professional life over everything else, um, I would love for you to put a yes into the chat if that has shown up for you. And if some, and if those professional boundaries with work time and family time and personal life and personal time show up in your life. Because that is, that is a place where there is an awful lot of common ground with all of us. And here's the trick and here's the tricky part about some of this compulsion to work and this workaholism that shows up for many people as I see the chat growing. Um, when we're in that, when our, when our sense of fear and insecurity is constantly activated, it means that our sympathetic nervous system is constantly activated. That's our stress response. And when that's the place where our biology is functioning, that's our fight or flight. It means that we are hypersensitive to things that are around us. It means that our body is constantly looking around and in this state of fight or flight, which is, there's a time and a place for it. When there's a hurricane coming and you need to shelter in place. When you swerve on the road because you're about to avoid an accident. When you are hiking and a bear is in the woods with you. When there is a fire alarm and you need to, and you need to evacuate a building. There's a time and a place for fight or flight. But when our body is constantly activated in that way, we don't get restful sleep. Our mood is impacted. Our digestion can typically be a mess. We lose our ability to be patient and compassionate, not only with ourselves, but with other people. Our body stores fat instead of burning it because it doesn't know when it's going to get nourished again. 
So constant fight or flight impacts everything. So as we look to how in the world can we start to start to figure out how to put some containers, put some structure, put some boundaries around our relationship with work or in, or in our personal lives, we find ways to walk away from that activated stress response all the time. And the health benefits are endless. So here's the third part. Here's that radical honesty number three. We're going in. Is it possible that some of, some of the challenges that you may face with boundaries, personally or professionally, or in the way that you volunteer and serve, is there a part of you that may believe that success requires running yourself ragged? And this is a little different than some of the money messages, than some of the kind of early messages about boundaries that we may have gotten from family. This is really about our relationship with money. If what were some of your early, what were some of your early messages about money in your house? Um, a couple of mine were um, money doesn't grow on trees. I heard that from grandparents. I heard that from parents. I heard that from aunts and uncles. I heard it from neighbors. Money doesn't grow on trees, Nicole. <laughs> that was a big one. What are some other ones that you heard? Oh, dad controlled spending. Absolutely. Yes. Do you think I'm made of money? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Money is tight. Yes. Mm-hmm. Might you have heard that hard work pays off, right? Hard work pays off. Could it be that, um, that everyone must pay their dues? I grew up with that too, right? If you Everybody has to pay their dues in order to be successful. Rob Peter to pay Paul. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If we stop and think about what some of those money messages are, are those story, how have those stories imprinted your boundaries with work? Right? I grew up looking at family members, looking at parents, looking at neighbor, looking at parents of friends, and they were grinding. They were working insane amounts of hours. They were working the 60, the 70, the 80 hour week, right? And that was, I associated that with being normal. I didn't really grow up knowing a lot of people who worked what would be a 40 hour week. People were always working late going to work early. So some of the messages that I got really young was, it isn't about a 40 hour week that is successful, <laughs> that it has to be just about double that. And messages around, if you're not really grinding, you're not gonna be successful. Similar to the messages around boundaries, our relationship with money impacts our ability to set boundaries with work to set boundaries with spending because we have all of these messages that have been that have been imprinted on us and we don't necessarily realize that they're there because it's just been through through some of our own personal development and through our own natural development that we pick up on and we do what what has been modeled for us so here's the first opportunity for us today what do you want your relationship with money to be? What do you want it to be? And put that in the chat for us as well. What do you want it to be? Do you want it to be something that's paralyzing and constricting? Can money be a way to pursue interests? Can, can your relationship with money be related to your own worthiness and your own, um, your own sense of self. If you are a leader, if you're leading an organization, if you are a leader in your own business, right? What are, what's your fee structure? Does that reflect your knowledge and your skills and your talents and your abilities? Do you deserve to be paid well for the expertise that you bring? So what do you want your money, money 
story to be. Is money about power or is money really about just energy? Can it be transactional instead of so value laden and assumption laden for us? Money's fluid and flexible, yep. Not control and being able to be generous with funds, absolutely. It can be a way, money can be a way that we empower other people through philanthropy, absolutely. It can be a tool that we use to lift others up. It can be one of the resources that we have available to us. So the next piece that I wanna talk about before we move forward is this whole idea about some of the guilt that may be associated with having boundaries. Um, that goes back to some of our early messaging as well, right? For people who said no to us, for people who, when we were growing up and even now, who have, who have pretty good boundaries in place, right? Is, it, do, is there any guilt attached to you sometimes when you say no, when someone comes to you and asks for something and you say no? Can there be guilt attached to that? I would say yes, probably. There can be. But here's how we put the guilt aside when we talk about boundaries. If our boundaries are a reflection of how we honor and respect ourselves and not really about the other person, then setting them and recalibrating them and readjusting them can be an easier process because our boundaries about, are about us, not, about, not necessarily about other people. It can be a way to, it, sometimes, I think sometimes boundaries can feel selfish. If you've ever set boundaries or reset them with someone and felt like walked away and in your mind, you're like, oh, that was kind of a selfish act on my part. Put a yes in the chat. That has definitely happened for me at different times where you feel like, oh, I'm being selfish. I'm letting somebody else down because I am, because I'm resetting or I'm recalibrating a boundary with them. Yeah. Oh, I love it, Barbara. Yep. I feel like I'm being the B word. Yep. Yep. When you're setting up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Powerful messages. When they really are away. Oh, yes. And then there's the family piece. Mm -hmm. Setting them with family. To be a good family member, you have to always be available. You have to always give. You have to always support. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Very true. So we are going to jump and Tasha's going to move our Tasha's going to move our slides forward one for us. And here's an action step for today. Give yourself 10 minutes sometime before your day ends to just journal, free write, brainstorm on the different boundaries in your life and maybe there's one or two that need to be revisited. This might not be really, really clear to you right now, but I'm gonna guarantee that when we get to the next two parts, you're gonna be like, oh yes, this might be a place where I need to do some assessment and reevaluation. Um, I invite you to do this 10 minute free write, brainstorm, journaling from a place of absolutely not judging yourself, just from a place of what are they? Where is a place that might need some attention? Where maybe it is in the hours that you're working. Maybe it is with a colleague um, who has that tendency to say, I didn't have time to do this. Can you, can you help me out here? Maybe it's at home with a family member. Maybe it's with your neighbor. Maybe it's in your faith community. But just give yourself 10 minutes to do that brainstorm and see where you land. Next slide, please, Tasha. So... We might not be thinking about it in this way, but here's one of the things that I've been thinking about since the shelter in place in March, right? Total transformation of our living spaces. How many of your living spaces now look like this? It's the playground and the recreation space. It's the movie theater. It's the school classroom. It's your home office. It's the boardroom, right? And that's in, that's in addition to what your living space typically is, right? What other, what other places are now in your living space that I may have left out of these images, right? 
What other things have crept into your house since the shelter in place in March? I think some of our living spaces are now our personal gyms, <laughs> right? It could be your gym. It could be your, um, it could be time to have those, it could be time to have a family meeting around a boardroom, whatever it is. Our living spaces, oh, the full service restaurant, absolutely. Yep, 100%. Our living spaces have transformed, not by choice, but out of our need to respond to something that's happening that's much larger than we are, right? And it's really been a game changer in helping us redefine how we work, how we live, how we play, um, how we connect with family and how we connect with other people. This is also a place because now our living spaces are no longer what they were maybe at last year at this time where boundaries are incredibly important because if you are now working from home and that is, and that is still new to you and you're still trying to figure it out, which is totally normal. Um, you have a blended space of where does my work day start? Where does my work day end? <laughs> How do I take these phone calls? Where can I be standing when I have to do a Zoom so they're not looking at my bathroom or a dirty kitchen or <laughs> beds that aren't made or anything like that? COVID-19 has been an opportunity for all of us to reassess and reflect on where some of our boundaries are within our homes. And it's not something that we have chosen to do. So we are being required to do some of that reflection, required to do a lot of that recalibration, not because we said, oh, please give me this learning opportunity. I'm really looking forward to learning these lessons. No, this has been handed to us because now we have multi-purpose living spaces all of the time. Tasha dropped in an article um, that has a link to it for juggling working and parenting from home. And it offers some really good tips about how do we start to figure that out? How in the world do we start to navigate, for some of us, homeschooling or having our kids at home, when their school schedule and our work schedule overlap and your spouse or partner's work schedule overlaps and you have, um, and you have um, pets in there and extended family members that were in there, it can be really tricky. And it's not something that many of us can do very easily. It's a place where it becomes really easy for that tipping point to happen where we're sitting going, Hmm, <laughs> how do I not work all the time? Or honestly, how do I get work done? Because now my time and my energy is, is in a very different place. And, and it's requiring me to be able to say, I now need to focus on work and being a parent and now I'm a teacher and I have to do all these different things at once. There we go. So we've got a live link in there if you wanna click on that and bookmark that. Certainly a helpful article with some really good tips about how do we thread that needle? Because truthfully, it is not easy <laughs> at all. Tasha, next slide, please. So here's the other piece. How many hats were you wearing in your life from January to February to early March? Um, if you think about, okay, I am, I'm a pet parent, I'm a spouse, I'm an entrepreneur, right? That may have been us, that may have been you before shelter in place. When this transformation in your living spaces happened, when all of the shelter in place or guidelines came down and that was a 180 degree game changer for every single person in a different way, how many more hats are you wearing today? I would love for you to put some of these into the chat. What are the different things that you are doing now that you were not doing last year at this time? You could be a school principal at this point. You could be a caregiver. You may be a personal trainer. You may be an activities director for your family. 
you could be the source of entertainment for your young children. Um, many of us found, our, found ourselves in teaching roles when our children were now at home and not in school and not on their campus and not in their classrooms or in a traditional Google Classroom. You may find yourself, in addition to being um, a business leader and the leader of an organization, you may have found yourself also being a sounding board um, and a mentor and a counselor to others. So what are some of the other roles that you have taken on since COVID? Because again, this gets to where are our boundaries and what can we control? Because we can certainly keep piling the hats on. I mean, I can put 10 hats on top of my head. I cannot, as a human being, nimbly meet all of the needs for all of those specific roles. So it becomes this question of what do I do to go forward? What do I do? How do I manage all of it? One of the other things that's really helpful, um, and Tasha is going to drop another article in, um, which might be very helpful for some of you who are parents um, and have become the teacher and the tutor and the school principal. <laughs> um, Typically, when we get to this point in the year, it's summer. There's, a t there's time to refuel, right? There's time to, for kids to be out of the house, for everybody to be out of the house, time to take some space. Um, an article that I really enjoyed um, that came out early in July was for parents who have been in these educator roles that are very unfamiliar to themselves. Um, how do you start to refuel this summer now that things are still in this state of difference? because we have not yet created our new next. We have not yet had the opportunity to create our next new normal. So that might be insightful for some of the parents that are on today as well. And our next piece, if Tasha will advance our slides for us, that would be lovely, really gets to what I just started to talk about. How do we start to create self-honoring practices during these extraordinary times. When our living spaces are multi-purpose, what do we do, right? There's no longer a commute to work. Your commute could be down the hall. Your commute could be, oh, I just had breakfast at the table. Now I'm gonna move to another table <laughs> and now I'm at work and I'm in my office. So here are a couple things that we can do relative to some of our boundaries that can help us honor what we need and who we are. One of them is to, is to work to the best of your ability to have a start and an end to your work days. Because right now, when your office is your dining room table, it can be really hard to put it away <laughs> because there's not really anywhere to walk to. It can be really hard to say, <laughs> it is now six o'clock, <laughs> I've been at this all day, I'm now gonna transition into being a spouse, being a partner, being a parent, um, taking care of myself, making dinner. So part of having a start and an end to the workday also goes hand in hand with the second tip, which is about finding those flexible times. Many of us have flexibility when our workday starts at this point, right? So is there a way, if you have children at home, or if you have other people in your house that need your attention, can you find some of those flexible times to maybe have up until nine or 9.30 in the morning, be some family time with your kids, and then shift into that work time and that work day that you need? If you are in a caregiving role with another person, can you find some, some flexible times within your day to build in some of those connections and those interactions? If we can find the flexible time, we move into a place of choice, we move into a place of agency, but how do we want to use it? The next practice that we can, that we can begin, or at least take a 100% take a good effort swing at, is start to create a morning routine. And this is incredibly important. As we are again, our living spaces are blended. Our dining room table could be the boardroom, it could be the executive suite, and it could be our office, and it could be a school, it could be a school classroom. What kind of a routine can you start at the beginning of the day 
that's going to help set the tone for the rest of the day. Are you someone who likes to get up and sit outside with your hands around a mug of tea? Can you journal in the morning for a few minutes um, about uh, a goal or an intention that you have for the day or jotting down notes about a really vivid dream that you had the night before? Can you start the day with a gratitude practice of acknowledging something that you're grateful for as this new day begins? Maybe you like to start your day with movement. Maybe you are an early morning gym person or runner or walker or bike rider. Can you start your day moving your body that gets you physically present in your body and clears your mind so that the, so that the rest of the day ahead of you is a clean slate? Finding some practices that really keep us moving forward that are separate from our work day. Help us set those boundaries and help us hold them. And here's the most important part. On your calendar, start to put in time for this morning routine. Block out time on your calendar if you're gonna be starting your day at maybe nine or 9.30 or you start your day at 10 o'clock and you want time with your children or your partner or your spouse or the person you're caregiving for, put on your calendar that that's what happens in the morning. And do that unapologetically. Have that calendar be visible to your team because it's also a powerful leadership moment for you when your team members say, oh my goodness, <laughs> she's getting all these things done. He's getting all these things done. And at the same time, they're also not working all the time. They're taking time with their children. They're taking time with their spouse. They're taking time with an extended family member who's living in their household that they're caring for. When we commit the time and we put it on our calendars, whether or not you are a pen and paper person, whether or not your calendar is on your laptop or on your smartphone or on your tablet, own that time. Own it unapologetically and share it with people around you. They get to see that helps them reflect on what am I doing? It's a powerful, powerful leadership moment for all of us. So Tasha dropped in a couple more articles. Um, one is about the morning routine that might have some really good tips for you, especially when most of us are still in this working from home environment. And the next one really starts to get to mindset because 80% of our success is our mindset. 80% of our success is not our skills or who we know or our talents. It is all up here. It is that scarcity or the abundance. It is the growth mindset. It is the fixed mindset. If we approach a situation with, I need to covet and put, put, put up big walls around everything that I have because there's not enough for everyone else, we're coming from a place of scarcity. When in fact, there is more than enough for everyone. Our mindset sets the tone for how we interact with other people, how we lead our organizations, how we support our team members, how we interact with our neighbors and people in our faith communities. If we are exhausted and run down and have run ourselves ragged, that's, that's, our, that's the version of ourselves that we bring to everyone else. So how do you start to shift it? There's another article that Tasha just dropped in, which is some common thinking patterns that can keep us stuck. And the first step to try to adjusting them is actually just noticing when they show up. Noticing when we come from this place of scarcity. Noticing where when we come from this place of nothing will ever change and this is exactly how everything has to be. Or do we or can we come from this place of what can I learn from the challenge that has crossed my path today? What can I learn from this crazy experience that is COVID about the work that I want to do, about how I am leading my organization, about how I am supporting my colleagues? about how I am empowering my team. 
Carol Dweck wrote a revolutionary book um, on mindset. And if this is a topic that you want to dive into, I would highly recommend her book um, on mindset. It talks specifically and dives way into growth versus fixed mindset. And it's something that I read about, gosh, 12 years ago. And it's something that I pick up on a regular basis. Because there are times when we all get stuck, when we all feel as though everything is happening to us. And in fact, when we can slow down and notice the place that we're coming from, um, it can really open up so many more possibilities for all of us. So it's also a way for us to be nourishing and to be taking care of ourselves and to really work on our boundaries. So I'm gonna have Tasha advance the, to, to this next slide, please. And we're gonna go into some really quick breakout groups for just a few moments today. And this is an opportunity for everyone to participate and for each person to have about two minutes to respond. And here's the question. What becomes possible for you personally and professionally when you are rested and focused and nourished and have this clear head and are filled with energy? Because one of the ways that we get to that place is really around the boundaries that we hold with ourselves, with our work, um, with the institutions and the organizations we engage in and with. Um, Barbara asked a question about some of the links and you can see them if you go to the bottom of your screen um, and you click on the chat, you should be able to click on those links. Um, but Tasha, um, Tasha has those and she can make sure that she can send some of those out. Um, because these are, and when you click on any of the articles, um, this is also a plug for the Thrive Global Newsletter. It comes out every day. You get all kinds of articles from so many different voices that just show up in your inbox. So it's kind of magical. So here's what we're gonna do. We are gonna go into breakout groups and I'm gonna encourage, um, make sure that you have somebody that's kind of helping to keep time because that's an important piece of this. Um, so we've each got about two minutes to respond and Tasha is gonna work her magic in breakout groups that are gonna magically and automatically sort us into different rooms. If you want to take a screenshot of this question um, so you know what you're gonna be responding to and we're gonna see everybody back here. Um, Tasha, let's actually, um, yeah, we can set it for, we can still set it for two minutes for each person. And we will see you back here in just a couple minutes. Thanks so much for joining us, David. I hope to see you next week. Thanks for tuning in today. And here come our groups. Everybody is coming back into our room. And as we do that, we're, I'm gonna have Tasha go to our final slide today. Um, and this is an opportunity to drop into the chat. Um, what is something that, um, maybe a way that you were able to join some dots today, any kind of insight that you had from today, from the conversation, um, maybe from the conversation that you just had in your breakout group, that's gonna be really helpful for you. Because part of this is all about having a conversation and taking in information, but then figuring out what's something that I'm going to take away and what will I do with it. And as, and as people type those in, um, if this has been a topic that's of interest to you, if this has been something where you're like, wow, I really want to continue this conversation, or I want to learn more about what I do, um, as a coach um, and as a workshop facilitator, Tasha dropped into the chat um, a link to stay connected to me and to stay connected to Root to Rise coaching and the community that I am building. Um, and there's a link in there to stay connected. Um, and Tasha's also going to drop a link in if you want to take some action today and sign up for next week. Um, and next week, it's kind of a funky title, um, but I'm gonna give you just a tiny little version about what it's all about. Um, and the theme of next week in the title is really getting us out of the trunk and into the driver's seat. And the subtitle is really about how COVID-19 
has really plucked many of us out of the role and out of a place where we have been most comfortable. Most of us drive our own cars. Um, most of us make all of our own decisions <laughs> and have a lot of free reign with how we work and how we live and how we connect with other people. COVID-19 for many of us has felt as though something has come down and literally pulled us out of the driver's seat, out of some of the, and has taken away much of the control that we have in our lives. And has either plucked us, some of us in the trunk, and some of us may feel like we've been put into a child seat in the back of our car. So next week is all about coming together and getting into a couple different breakout groups and having some other activities around what are the things that we can control and what are the things that are beyond our control and starting to choose where we want to put our energy. Because we do not have endless amounts of energy. We only have so much. And it's thinking very tactically and strategically about where we want to invest that energy. Um, and some steps that we can take to start to create more normalcy um, for ways that we can start to take back some of the control that it may feel has been um, taken from us pretty darn abruptly and has continued. Um, COVID, as we know, is not yet over. <laughs> we have not yet written the concluding chapter to COVID-19 and how it shows up in the United States and how it shows up around the world. And next week is a chance for us to say, what is within my locus of control? What do I want to take responsibility for? And how do I start to do that um, in a way that really honors who I am and honors other people in my life? So, Barbara, John suggested a book on boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. Uh, I'm not, I think I've heard of it, but I don't know if I can get, I don't know if I can give you the title to that one either. Um, yeah. And Kristen liked talking about burnout and how boundaries can prevent it. Absolutely. These are important conversations, everybody. Um, it's important for us to take the opportunity just for a little bit of reflection. And it's important for us to come together and start to have these conversations. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm going to stay on in case anybody has questions um, or wants to chat briefly. I hope to see you guys next week. And if you're interested in joining next week, again, Tasha put in the link um, and also share it with other people because we're continuing this dialogue about how we're all functioning in 2020 because it is extraordinary. It was extraordinary how it started and I am confident it will be extraordinary however it ends. So take care of yourselves, take care of each other and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. And you can unmute yourself if you want to talk. Mm -hmm. I love this. Lucy said, boundaries, order, structure, is success. I love that. That's a good equation. I'm keeping that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And isn't it interesting You're welcome, that, Sharon. In that equation, sorry. there can be flexibility. <laughs> I love it. If anybody has questions, they are welcome to, to jump on or put in any comments that they might have and or to head off into the rest of your afternoon. Whatever works. I love it. Okay.